Welcome to Stress-Free IEP. You do not need to do it all alone. With your host, Frances Schefter, Principal of Schefter Law. She streams a show live on Facebook on the last Tuesday of every month at noon Eastern. Get more details and catch prior episodes at www.schefterlaw.com. The Stress-Free IEP video podcast is also posted on YouTube and LinkedIn. And you can listen to episodes through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Now, here's the host of Stress-Free IEP, Francis Schefter. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to have our next guest, Lori Maloney. Um, Lori, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Laurie Maloney. I'm an academic language therapist. I've been practicing in the DC metro area for, gosh, over 25 years. And I work primarily with children with specific learning disabilities, uh, ADHD, um, executive dysfunction, that sort of thing. And I work one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I go into schools or meet students at home or they come to my office. And um, um, that's primarily what I do. I'm the former president of the uh, DC Capital Area branch of the International Dyslexia Association. I was president for, gosh, five years, five years, I believe. Um, and then on the board prior to that, I teach a summer program on behalf of ASDEC for middle and high school students. I'm also co-founder of Decoding Dyslexia DC, and we were able to uh, work with the council to get a bill drafted, passed, and fully funded. And that bill is being implemented as we speak. So I've been committed to literacy for my whole career, and it is a tremendous source of satisfaction for me. It's a cause that I greatly believe in. That is so awesome. I didn't realize it had gotten fully funded. Um, mm -hmm. I knew you were working on the bill, but yeah. that is so great because that's going to mean so much more. Dyslexia is such a hot topic right now because schools yeah. are only just now recognizing it. And what are, you know, so many struggle, so many students struggle to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. Like, Why is that? What's happening? Yeah. With the struggles? Well, I think you could take a, about a hundred year view uh, to, to really fully appreciate what's happened. Um, you know, for, for hundreds of years from the time that books were printed until about the mid 1800s, um, teachers did a very good job of teaching children to read uh, because they taught students the code. And they really focused on learning those letter sound patterns, um, um, cursive handwriting was stressed, basic grammar was stressed. And children had a good command of the, of the foundational skills before they went into what we would think of as middle school. Um, in about the late 1800s, the, the whole concept of teaching reading radically shifted um, to a process whereby students would look at words and through repeated readings, commit those words to memory. And so that was the, the birth of the whole language movement, which started at the University of Chicago and then spread to Columbia University. Um, that's when we started to see the first basal readers. And then um, from there on out, teachers really were trained to teach children to read by looking at words and memorizing words and and counting on pictures as visual cues. And that persisted, um, it persists today. Um, and so in the 1920s, that's when the reading disabilities cottage industry was born because now a lot of people were struggling to learn to read using those methods. Um, um, Dr. Samuel Orton and the researchers around him developed a teaching protocol that we now think of as Orton Gillingham. And, um, and so while he was uh, interested in the brain of dyslexics, what, what educators found out was that when you use these procedures, these approaches with neurotypical readers, they're going to do better. 
So what what we've been doing, um, people in the disabilities, you know, the the specific language learning disabilities field, have been using techniques that were developed during the 1930s and are able to teach uh, students with dyslexia as well as other struggling readers how to read using what is really basic, um, good, practical, effective teaching techniques. That's so, you know, I hear about OG all the time, Orton Gillingham, and everybody's calling it the new method, but it's not new, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's forever. Yeah. What, well, like, what what interventions do they use? Like, why is that program such a good program, and what it, what constitutes like good interventions okay. for heart struggling readers? So, Dr. Orton was responsible for understanding what was happening neurologically with people who couldn't read, but it was his wife June Orton and his assistants um, Anna Gillingham and Bessie Stillman who really developed a teaching protocol. These were people coming in who were otherwise intelligent, capable people who were simply having trouble reading. So Anna Gillingham and Bessie Stillman wrote the book, <laughs> wrote the manual on how to address these problems. And um, they refer to it as a kind of a multi-sensory intervention. So you use your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and your motor system, your arm, your hand, and you learn the sound symbol uh, correspondences using all of your senses. And, um, you know, the language is, is, it is really a finite body of knowledge that teachers must, must know, the 26 letters of the alphabet, there are 45 unique English speech sounds, six types of syllables, about 100 ways in total to spell those sounds. And um, there are about a uh, about 10 or so patterns for dividing words into syllables. Um, and so they created a, a framework for teaching students these, these facts, basically, um, using these multisensory methods. And the people who studied with, with Anna Gillingham and Bessie Stillman then went off to their training centers or their teaching hospitals or wherever. And they created programs around these teaching principles. So really when you think of Orton Gillingham, you should be thinking about an a set of instructional principles. That is the instruction should be uh, explicit. Uh, you, you make no assumptions about what a person knows. It's explicit, it's direct, it's multi-sensory. It's cumulative and it follows a logical scope and sequence. There just happen to be these letters that we know and these speech sounds that we know. And so you teach those according to these general teaching principles. So those folks who trained with Anna Gillingham and, and Bessie Stillman then went off and created their own programs. So you have alphabetic phonics in the Texas area. You've got the Slangerland method in the Pacific Northwest. You've got Patricia Lindemu developing her materials. And then, you know, generation after generation, other people creating programs based on Orton Gillingham's um, original manual. Now, um, when someone says, my child is getting OG, what that really means is my child is getting some kind of instruction that's based on multi-sensory language instruction. Um, so there is no program out there that's called OG. <laughs> there are many, many programs that are somehow rooted in the principles that, that Gillingham and Stillman uh, put forth. Uh, Having said that, there's a great deal of, of difference between and among these OG programs. And um, if you were to, to set the scope and sequence of all these programs side by side, you would find extraordinary variation. And um, that may not be such a good thing <laughs> because there are there, there is a certain logic by which you have to teach uh, reading and spelling to a child. 
And um, you have to also take into consideration the degree of dis of 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 severity of the dyslexic. So you can have students that are very mildly involved to students who are very severely impacted. And one program may be appropriate and effective for the mildly impacted student, whereas the severely impacted student might need a very different and much more intense uh, um, intervention that moves at a different pace. Which makes so, sense, which totally makes sense because everybody learns differently. And it's, it. you know, it's, I'm so glad you clarified this because often I'll get clients or people saying, well, the teacher's not OG trained. Is there any such thing as OG trained technically? <sighs> it's such a ball of thorns. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, what does it mean to be OG trained? You know, somebody can take a 30 hour course and they can say that they're OG trained. You know, I took a three year course and uh, went through a 700 hours uh, practicum supervised by a master teacher. And I sat for a national registration exam that I studied for for months. <laughs> um, uh, so training, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say what constitutes you know, OG right. training. There, I will say that there is so much to know about the English language. It's um, it's a complex language. Uh, there is so much to know about the the manifestations of dyslexia in in children. Um, there's a lot to know about dyslexia itself, about the comorbidities like ADHD and dyscalculia and dysgraphia. Um, um, so, you know, I'm committed to learning lifelong about this, you know, about dyslexia, about the research that is ongoing. Um, but in terms of practice, I think at a minimum, one would need to know very, very, very deeply the structure of the English language and to have a toolbox of methods and materials that are appropriate for teaching um, students with severe dyslexia. So to right. me, that to me is, is OG, being OG trained. Which makes sense, which makes, yeah. it's a special training because dyslexic children definitely learn different. That's right. And it's knowing how to teach them to reach that part of the brain to make it work. That's right. Um, so if parents, you know, are confused or they're, you know, they get a new diagnosis and stuff, where can they find, like, how can they find out more about dyslexia and reading difficulties and what mm -hmm. might be going on with their child? Yeah, well, there are a lot of resources available. Um, um, you know, the International Dyslexia Association has a, a a website that has tabs just for parents that provides a lot of information. Um, the Decoding Dyslexia State Networks have tremendous um, sources of information. This is a, sort of a parent-driven group. Uh, there are families who participate who are somewhere along the line in their journey from diagnosis to remediation. And so this is a wonderful place to post your questions and get, you know, kind of crowdsource the responses. Um, the diagnosing psychologist should be a good source of information that can come in the form of a, a list of recommendations for, for the parents, for the teachers and so forth. Um, there are wonderful books about dyslexia some are better than others, but um, there are quite a few. The IDA website has a list of um, resources, books that are considered uh, valid and useful and recommended for parents to read. So there's a lot of really good information. There's some YouTube videos that are that are great and ones that are good for the children to watch themselves about, about being dyslexic and how um, um, it isn't, well, that they're in good company, <laughs> you know, that there are a lot of right. successful people who have dyslexia and have done wonderful things with their lives. 
And that's so important, I know, for the children to identify with, because I know I've seen it way too many times where it's gone undiagnosed or, un, un, you know, that schools aren't identifying dyslexia and they're not giving IEPs or not doing the evaluations mm -hmm. and we have to fight the schools for it. And the children right. think they're dumb because they're just not getting it. Right. right. And it's such a challenge. That's right. Um, so what what are steps? So I know like you were saying, there's lots of resources out there to learn about it. What can parents do? Like what are some good steps to get, you know, I do special education law and, and onto the IEPs. Like what are some good things that parents might be able to do to help their child or to help the school help their child? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, um, the child should be read to. So if the child cannot read, or if the reading is so burdensome that it's not enjoyable, um, the child should either be read to or listen to books on tape and, and follow along. So, you know, Audible or, um, or Learning Ally, you can get a Learning Ally subscription with your, with your uh, diagnosed, you know, your documentation from the psychologist. Um, I can help people get accounts with learning allies. So students should be listening to literature. They should be listening to language that is at the level of their interest, not necessarily the reading level, because that exposure to print is very, very important. They're exposed to vocabulary. They're exposed to different kinds of text structures. They're uh, developing their background knowledge. They're learning to love reading, even though it's still difficult. So listening to books, hearing books read is a bridge between not being able to read and one day being able to read, uh, hopefully with assistance from a good reading instructor. Um, so that's critically important. A lot of my students come to me, they've not been reading since first grade. They may be in seventh or eighth grade, they have not been reading. And so part of the problem that they're having when they do learn to read is that they don't know the meanings of a lot of words because they've simply not experienced them in, in print. And so uh, now we have a, the whole comprehension piece to work on and that usually involves vocabulary. So exposing children to books early and often is one of the best things that parents can do um, and to make it a priority because it's easy to it's easy to um, to tell a child that they don't have to read or listen to books because they don't like to. Um, mm -hmm. There are other fun things that they would prefer doing, but it's too important not to uh, not to do. It's you know it's funny you say that because um, a very good friend of mine is a reading specialist, and when my daughter was six months old, she babysat and she was reading to her. And I'm like, she's only six months old. And my friend's like, it doesn't matter. Start reading early, That's read right. every night. That's um, right. That's so right. yeah, which makes sense because, you know, we say it all the time is that with children, the more exposure they get, they're such sponges at that age that That's they right. can, you know, absorb so much more. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's actually important yeah. to start reading to children from the time they're six months because the more words that they hear by the time they start preschool, uh, the better able they are to learn to read and spell. Uh, that's been proven scientifically for, you know, 60 years. So wow. just hearing language, taking turns speaking, it's, it's very important. Which makes sense because I like it's just reminding me of like the deaf community who doesn't hear language and mm -hmm. how their st reading struggles can be so different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then what else, uh, like what else can, I mean, we have accommodations. What about goals? Like, do you have any recommendations of what goals should look like for children with dyslexia or with reading difficulties? Like for example, IEP goals? Yeah. Like for IEP goals. Okay. Like, I, I would say my first recommendation is that um, the goals much must be more granular. They're not granular and they need to be granular. What I mean by that is um, there are so many sub skills embedded in a particular goal. For example, we want, you know, we want Johnny to, to be able to read, you know, 20 CBC words 
at 90% accuracy after so many tries, right? That's a standard goal. Yeah. But what's embedded in that goal? Oh my goodness, <laughs> there are so many sub skills. For example, uh, can the student accurately pronounce all of those letters? Does the student have accurate uh, pure vowel sounds? Um, can the student blend letters, letter sounds? So we have to do a much better job of understanding the specific nature of the, of the reading difficulty itself and then build goals around those difficulties. That so, I mean, a lot of students come to me even in high school who, who don't have pure vowel sounds. They see the letter E and they say, ah, and that's not the sound of short e. How does it happen that a, you know, a 15 year old confuses all of his vowel sounds? Well, they were never explicitly taught. So right. we have to break things down in our yeah. screening and find out specifically what are the problems? Is it a blending problem, you know? Or is it that the student um, doesn't recognize a closed syllable in a word, I, I, I give my students, um, I put the word, I'll show you. I do this all the time with my older students. So when they come and they're um, during the intake, I'll say, what's this, let's see, what's this word? And nine times out of 10, the student will say bipped, bipped. They'll look and they'll say, okay, this is the suffix ed, the, this word is bip. Well, there's no such word as bipped. The problem is that they were never taught how to divide long words into syllables. And if they'd been taught, they would know that the first pattern is to divide between two consonants. But we don't have two consonants. So the rule is divide after the first vowel. Now, they've never been taught syllable type, so they don't recognize this B-I as an open syllable. That's one of the six types. So this is by, and this is closed syllable ped, biped. Biped is any, any creature that walks on two feet. Um, so you well. see, you know, just by not knowing syllable types, that's going to wreck their comprehension when they're reading their science text. So we right. have to understand what is the nature of the reading difficulty itself? Where, where are the breakdowns? Then we can build goals around those difficulties. So the student must be able to, to identify syllable types in a group of 20 words. That's a much better goal because if right. the student can recognize syllable types, um, then you have a much better term. chance of being able to decode the word. There are six types of syllables in the English language, and letters are a lot like numerals in that letters have place value too. So where a letter shows up in a syllable will often dictate its sound. Most people don't know this, but the letter Y represents four sounds. And where that Y shows up in words like yes, Jim, fly, and baby, initial position, medial right. position, and final position, the letter, the letter sound will change. So a lot of OG programs don't necessarily focus on syllable type. I personally have a problem with that for the for the reasons I just stated. Right. But if it you teach, if you teach a child the the syllable types and how these letter sounds can change based on their position, then you're giving the child a fighting chance at being able to decode unfamiliar words. This and the is SAT why, words. Right. Exactly. And this is why a 30-hour training in OG may be inadequate, because there is so much to know about this language. It has what's called a deep orthography, meaning that because the letters represent more than one sound, many of them do, um, we have a tremendous uh, dictionary of over a million words. So we have to know 
uh, how letters are sounded in different kinds of syllables, but also how sounds are spelled. Because take the letter A. The letter A represents five sounds. And the sound A can be spelled 12 different ways. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, that's amazing. And yeah. so how do you, like, I mean, I've seen, I mean, thousands upon thousands of, of evaluations that the school do, and they definitely don't go that deep. Is there right. assessments that you do separate um, for your students to figure out the granular issues? Yes, yes I do. I do. I do a variety of things to to kind of peg where the student is um, from. Can they can they sequence the alphabet and make no assumptions about the older student being able to sequence the alphabet? Uh, I have them uh, write a paragraph. I'm looking at their grip, their spelling, their word choice, punctuation, how much they can write or what they think a paragraph means in terms of number of sentences. Do they have a topic sentence, a concluding sentence, a few details? Um, does it seem to be the, does it seem to be as sophisticated as it should be for their grade level? Um, then I ask them to name all the letters of the alphabet and produce the sounds that those letters represent. Um, I have them read nonsense words, real words, multisyllable words, words with suffix endings, phrases and sentences. Um, I have them read a passage that's um, about a first grade level. And I look for deletions of words, uh, substitutions, additions, or just, you know, mis misread words. Then I have them read a passage that would be on grade level, and I'm looking for the same kinds of issues. And so based on all of that, I look for patterns, and I see patterns, and, and, um, and then I, I can tell exactly what we need to, what we need to work on. I, 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 I sort of reteach them the structure of the English language, how to spell, how to decode, um, and we, fix their handwriting at the same time. So I'm interested in, in improvements in handwriting, spelling, decoding, and comprehension at the same time. So a lot of OG programs don't prioritize handwriting and spelling as much as other programs do. And so you'll see students who learn to decode and they can read chapter books beautifully. But they, if you look at their written work, it looks like they've had no intervention at all. That's unfortunate. That's avoidable. So we want to address all aspects of, of literacy uh, simultaneously. Okay. Right. Which sounds, it sounds to me that, you know, as much as the schools can do, if there's true going on that the parents have to do outside, would you say most of the time you see that? You know, it really differs. It, it, it's hard to make a blanket statement. I mean, there are, you know, there are plenty of teachers out there who have uh, taken training to, to do better. Then there are other teachers who are really limited in what they can do because the school follows a curriculum. Um, all I'll say is that we as a society underestimate, grossly underestimate uh, the 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 depth of the training involved in adequately preparing uh, pre-service teachers to come into classrooms. Right. And we, um, you know, we, we underestimate how difficult it is for human beings to learn to read. We're not, we're not wired to, to be readers. We have to learn to read. And, um, and we really underestimate you know what it what it takes, how much time it takes to teach children to read. So, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, much of the day was spent on these foundational skills. Now it's you know a couple of hours, and that makes a difference. Right. I've also taught groups of children. Um, I've been running a Saturday literacy program at a Title One school this past year on Saturdays, and. Uh, all of the children were identified as uh, being behind their classmates. And, and this was not the first time I've done this. This is the second cohort. And what I have found is that 
even among the children who struggle, there's great uh, variation in the nature of their difficulties and the time that it takes them to come up to speed. So, uh, you know, when I think about the typical early educator in a class of 25 children, a, a couple of whom are going to be truly dyslexic, and then there's going to be another 50% who will end up reading below grade level or reading less proficiently than they should, about a third to a quarter of the class will have no difficulty learning to read. I think about what a tremendous, tremendous job that that teacher has. And I don't know that it's, you know, I, I think it's just a Herculean job to, <laughs> to, you know, to teach everyone to be reading on the same level. We no. really do, like I said, we really do, you know, underestimate the complexity of teaching reading and and how children learn and what they need. I mean, in an ideal world, you know, that 60% of children in the classroom, at least the 30% of, of the children who will really struggle, they almost should be taught one-on-one -on -one by a skilled teacher because their needs are so great, you know? Yeah. It, it, oh yeah, no, I know it. Cause that's, I mean, when I taught, you know, I taught kindergarten yeah. and then for a year, I was a reading tutor within the classroom. So we, you know, I pulled kids out one on one right. um, with the reading program to help learn. And it's just, I, I mean, I remember I had 38 kids and one paraprofessional. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, okay. And then I remember, you know, it's funny because that I was just early childhood originally. And then I went back and got um, special education training. And I remember my special education classes going, why don't they teach this for regular education teachers? Yeah. Like all of the techniques we learn as special educators, everybody would benefit from. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, that's exactly it, right. It just amazes me. I mean, the teachers today and going through COVID, I don't know how they do it. Um, mm -hmm. I love them. They're great. I always say, yeah. you know, um, I just like to help the teachers. Like what can we do to get a good IEP together to help the children? Yes. Get to where they need to be. Yeah. And sometimes the schools can, and sometimes parents have to go on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. There's a wonderful website and I, I'll send you the link, but it's a woman on YouTube who just presents the pure speech sounds. It's really worth looking at, particularly if you're an early educator, because a lot of my students come to me and their sounds are not a hundred percent, uh, correct. So the first thing teachers can do is correct their own speech sounds. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> yeah, which add, is modeling. Yeah. Yeah, they tend to add that uh sound like ya yeah and wa th and we want them to clip that. We want nice crisp pure sounds. Um they got rid of cursive, but I only teach cursive and um it, it's a wonderful language input device. So when we teach the properties of a letter, we teach the cursive shape in the gross motor system and in the graphomotor system. And so um, I hope that, you know, that it comes back and stays. The other missed opportunity uh, that, that affects the classroom is when teachers teach the name of the letter, when they're telling the students how to write the letter, uh, but they're not teaching the sound simultaneously. So what we want to do is link that. You know, you've been in countless IEP meetings where where faculty will say, well, we don't teach spelling here. Or we don't teach spelling. Right. Um, as though that were a point of pride, right? Right. Well, we certainly can teach spelling. And in fact, you should, you must be teaching spelling. It's not that hard. So when you teach to a first grade or second grader, the letter sounds, you should be teaching the letter shapes as well. And you should link the shape of the letter with the sound. That is spelling. That, that is spelling. Sense. So then you can teach connected letters. You can teach students to, to utter the sounds when they're writing those letters. Then you can teach students to spell on a syllable by syllable, sound by sound basis. That That's makes so much sense. Right. And that makes so much sense because who cares what the name of the letter is if you don't know the sound of the letter? Right. And we teach the name of the letter all the right. time. 
And there's no reason where you, and this is, oh, this is pure OG, letter name, right. letter sound, and the keyword that goes with it. T, table, t, while you write the letter in the air. T, yeah. table, t. So you're bringing all the properties of the letter together. More importantly, you're linking the brain regions, you know, the temporal, parietal, the occipital, the motor, you know, you're linking all of those. You're doing that with a lot of repetition. So you're making super highways. You're increasing the speed, the automaticity. That's what we want. We want students to be able to write letters and spell little words below the level of their consciousness. And so you do that through repeated practice, but you've got to get the arm going. You've got to get the eyes right. looking at the letters and hearing, and you know. Yeah. So you mentioned, I know you've mentioned high school a lot. Is there a specific age group you work with or do you work with eight, all age groups? All age groups from first grade. I, you know, last year I worked with um, two college freshmen who, who were really learning to read. I mean, they, they, they were disfluent readers. They're having trouble keeping up with the, with the curriculum in college which as you know, is mostly reading and paper writing. Um, and they just didn't have the speed and accuracy. So at, you know, 19 years old, they're in their dorm room <laughs> going to the table, but it helps. And um, so I work with people of all ages, wherever wow. they are, what, at whatever stage of, you know, of, uh, of, of difficulty. Yeah, that makes sense. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. And how can people reach you? I have a website. Okay. LMSmaloney.com. Great. And that'll be added in the show notes. Um, and is there anything else? Like, are there any other pointers you have for parents that have children that have dyslexia, dysgraphia, reading issues of like how they can advocate for their children? Mm -hmm. I would say um, understand their rights. That's where you come in. That's very, very important that they understand uh what it is that they can legally expect schools to provide their child. Um, they need to have a good understanding of what constitutes a good intervention. So there are websites like Understood, some of the some of the um, sites like uh, International Dyslexia Association's website has a link to a document called the Knowledge and Practice Standards for Teachers of Reading. But that's good for parents to know about as well. So when parents are educated about what they understand constitutes a good reading intervention, then they can ask for those things. And the more that parents ask, uh, the, the chances go up that schools will respond. Now, schools are aware that they need to change the way that that their teachers are teaching reading. You may know that New York City now just throughout all the balanced literacy curricula and bringing in um, structured literacy or you know programs based on the science of reading. That's what we want everywhere. That's what our bill is gonna bring in DC. Right now, uh, schools are choosing the screening tools that they're gonna be using to identify children with reading difficulties in, in kindergarten, first, second grade. The following year, the teachers will be trained on a, on new curriculum that are based on uh, the science of reading. So this is happening in some states around the country, like Mississippi. So parents need to be aware of the legislation and the changes that are occurring in other states so that they can advocate for, for the similar kinds of changes uh, in, in, in the state that they live in. It, 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 it's very much going to be a parent-powered um, process to 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 um, to turn this Titanic, you know, <laughs> on a dime. It's going to take a lot of people involved in in just advocating for, you know, better uh, teacher prep and better methods and materials in the classroom. Um, what else can I suggest to parents? Um, talk to other parents who have gone through this process. Get as much advice as they can. Um, but I'll just come back to reading, you know, listen yeah. to books, look at books that are being read to you. There's all sorts of, of sources. If you go to the internet and just type in free sources of audiobooks, you'll come up with dozens, 
dozens of free sources yeah. and you can download them to your computer or your phone. Um, and I know there was a bunch of them that um, the stars were reading the stories. Yes. Um, Cause during, especially during COVID. Yeah. So you, could, you know? Yeah. You know, parents make time for soccer. They make time for ballet and <laughs> they make time for, yeah. you know, Taekwondo um, reading and writing are skills that are necessary for a lifetime. So parents really need to prioritize this. It's way too important. The other thing is don't put off, don't put off investigating what's going on with your child. So if there's any concern about their progress, um, they can go to their local public school and ask for a screening meeting and get the ball rolling. Um, and don't take, I say it all the time, don't take no for an answer. Because no an answer. a lot of times, I mean, I've had clients all the time come back in the schools like, your child's doing fine, we're not as evaluating. No, right. that's not acceptable. Right. Keep pushing, trust the, I always say, tr trust your parent intuition. That's exactly it's, right. It's right. That's right. <laughs> so I'll say that it's never too late to intervene because as I said, I've worked with students of all ages and they've made progress. Um, but the trajectory is going to be much higher if you intervene right. when the child is young. I mean, that's just, that just stands to reason. Their brains are very plastic and they, they pick up the concepts very quickly. Um, and they, you know, the, the low self-esteem and those issues haven't set in. So um, definitely, if there are any concerns, if there's a family history of reading difficulties, that's a cue that, you know, because it's so heritable, you know, deal with it early, get it checked out early. I didn't even think about that, the hereditary factors. Yes. That makes sense. But that makes sense. Why not? Our brains work the way our parents' brains work. That's right. That That's is so right. awesome. Thank yeah. you so much, Lori. It has been, I like, I learned so much, even with all of my training and stuff yeah. that, that you don't realize. I mean, there is. It's it's reading's, reading's hard. It's hard. <laughs> um, it's hard. Thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. on the show. It's been awesome having you. And for thank those, you. our listeners watching, uh, my information and Lori's information will be below in the show notes that you can reach either one of us if you have any questions. Thank you so Thanks much for, for watching. having me. Of course. You've been listening to Stress-Free IEP with your host, Francis Schefter. Remember, you do not need to do it all alone. You can reach Francis through schefterlaw.com where prior episodes are also posted. Thank you for your positive reviews comments, and sharing the show with others through YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more.